Hello and welcome to another edition of The Family Business. I'm your host, Joe Casiglione Jr. Got my co-host, Isaac Stoops. Today, we got Kenny Stills. Uh, Sooner great, seven, eight, eight year NFL pro career and just a hell of a guy. Kenny, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. Nine years. Don't don't skip nine me. Years, nine years, nine years, <laughs> nine years. My bad. I ended up wrong, I guess, before the show. Yeah. Can't skip me on that one next year. We hear you. <laughs> we hear you. I uh, miscounted Wikipedia, I guess. Yeah. Never trust Wikipedia <laughs> joining. Kenny, uh, let's talk about you be, You and Brennan Clay, Tony Jefferson, kind of trailblazing that OU Cali connection, the Cali trio. Talk about your recruitment a little bit. Talk about how you ended up in Oklahoma because it wasn't as common as it was then it is today. So just talk about a little bit how you ended up uh, in a Sooner uniform. Yeah, so Brendan Clay actually was committed um, to OU before. And so Tony and I, being all San Diego kids, you know, thought we wanted to go somewhere together as a group. So we decided to take a, to, a visit to Norman. And, uh, you know, Ryan Broyles was my host. And at that point, you know, the, the year before, Sam had gotten hurt and the receivers weren't really playing as well. And he, he told me straight up that if I just came to the school, if I was graduating high school early, like I said, I got there, I got with the, I got with Schmitty, I got strong and I learned the plays and I just came in and caught the football. If I would just catch the ball, like I could, I could go and, and have a great career there. And um, that sold me. I wanted to go somewhere that I could, I could go somewhere and play right away. And, and Ryan was a local guy, a humble guy and an incredible player. And to me, that was something that I, I wanted to strive to be if I were to ever be in his position, you know, if it was going to work out for me to be a star player, I wanted to be humble and I wanted to be about my work. And that's what Ryan was. And so it just, it all fell into place and it ended up being that us three California boys, you know, ended up in Norman together. You know, I graduated high school early, so um, I ended up getting on campus and the NCAA didn't accept a couple of my credits. So I had to go back to high school for like, I think it was a couple of weeks or until I caught up with these other classes that I needed to take and then made my way back to Norman and got myself involved in the winter workouts and started putting that weight on and, and being terrorized by Schmitty. Man, nobody wants to go back to high school. <laughs> That's, yeah, for a couple of weeks. Yeah, they're like, like, what are you a, doing? What, yeah, what are like, you doing on campus? I'm like, your, NCAA, man. <laughs> what was your advisor thinking? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm talking about Ryan. Ryan, yeah, like you said, such a such a good dude, humble dude, and obviously one of the best receivers to ever play here. It's, it's cool to hear that story of how, you know, like, he was super, you know, humble towards you and like, hey, man, you can come in and you can play because not everybody's like that. You know, some guys have a, you know, a sort of an ego or a wait your turn type of thing. But um, I, I mean, talking about Tony and Brennan as well, do you still do you still keep up with those guys quite a bit? And Ryan, I mean, I saw you just here a couple years ago at the spring game. But um, yeah, I was just seeing. If yeah, no, I definitely uh, keep in contact with with Ryan, Tony, Brennan here and there. I know Brennan's out there in Oklahoma, so. But yeah, just touching on on what Ryan did and how, you know, how he acted. It was like he he knew that, you know, he was going to be double teamed. And so it was like he had he knew that I had the opportunity or somebody had the opportunity to come in and get the single coverage. And and that's what really sold me. He's like, "Look, we're going to have a two-headed monster, you know, possibly a three-headed monster with one of these other guys, and they're not going to know who to cover. They're not going to know who to stop." I tried to stop. And so um and that was something that throughout my career I was lucky to have guys um, in a leadership position that that led that way and and understood that, you know, if we all were good, then we were all going to benefit, you know. And so Ryan had that having that attitude knew that ultimately it was going to benefit him and the team. And so, um, yeah, obviously everybody's not like that, but that's something that I learned from him. And then once I got into the pros as well, that mindset's definitely not as common as it used. I mean, maybe not used to be, but it's not as common as you hear uh, kind of back then coming into Oklahoma uh, because of that mindset and having Ryan and having a couple other guys from California, did that help with the adjustment a little bit from a guy like you who came in and contributed year one um, and stepping in on campus early enrollee and kind of contributing year one to a big factor. Just talk a little bit about adjusting to Oklahoma as Oklahoma as a whole, because we know it's different than Cali. <laughs> you probably yeah. showed up for your official visit. You're like, 
where the hell am I? But <laughs> just yeah. coming into Oklahoma, adjusting to that Schmitty Live, coming in, adjusting to Division One football and so on. So did the leaders impact that a little bit and uh, the guys around you? Yeah, so I, I – um... We honestly weren't prepared for the winters of Oklahoma. Like we came during the season, it was cold, or during the fall, it was cold. But like I, I knew nothing about you know the temperament of the state, and so I was very surprised when we first got there in the winter. We struggled, Tony and I, getting up, going to workouts at five thirty in the morning. Um, I think you know you talked to Sh- Schmidty about guys that were contributors that missed workouts. Like we missed a handful of workouts to start. Um, just you know trying to get adjusted and i think at one point tony you know wanted to leave and transfer to usc and go back home because he was feeling homesick but i understood the assignment man when i left home i told myself i would never go back to san diego until uh, i could afford to live there and um so i i was leaving on a business assignment and guys used to laugh at me because i'd be training and once we got going i'd be telling people i'm gonna be here for three years and i'm out like i i'd be at 717 talking shit in the summertime like three and out like none of you motherfuckers can stop me (laughs) and they thought it was a joke but in my mind like i knew what i wanted to do i was there for business it could have been cold hot it could whatever it was like i was there on an assignment to win a big 12 championship to win a national championship and get drafted and go to the nfl and so uh yeah it was different but you know we we wanted to go to a college town we wanted to go to a place where we were you know shutting down the, the city and the state every time we played and I mean, when we got there, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, and Kevin Durant were were, were there at the Thunder, and the Thunder were just starting to blow up. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was just, you know, it was an incredible time to to be in to, to be in Oklahoma, to be in Norman. But the adjustment, you know, it was what it was. But I I felt like I was on a work assignment, and uh, you know, I, whatever I had to do to sacrifice to get to that place, I was going to do. Yeah, I was going to, you guys ever shut down 747? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I was underage the whole time I was in, I was in Norman. So I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, no, I got but yeah, you. we had, we had plenty of fun. No, on a serious note though, you talked about, you know, Tony, um, pot, you know, getting homesick and, and, uh, wanting to transfer home. And, and that was something that I was going to touch on and ask about was, you know, I mean, obviously you just kind of explained it for yourself. You were there on a, a business trip, but, um, just with the transfer portal nowadays, you know, it's so much more enticing. If you do get homesick, you can make that decision to go home without any immediate consequences, as opposed to, you know, sitting out a year, like that can really, you know, affect your decision-making to tough it out. So, I mean, I was just going to get your thoughts on how you feel about it nowadays. If you think there should be some guardrails set up or, you know, just kind of the direction that, you know, it's going. Man, it's tough to say. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, obviously we, we had a totally different experience without NIL, without the transfer portal, transfer portal, excuse me. Um, And so, you know, I, I value my experience and the fact of knowing like I made a decision, I made a commitment That's what I got to live with. But I also, you know, understood the fact and was frustrated with the fact that a coach could get fired or a coach could leave and the kids had to stay or we'd be penalized. And so just trying to find that happy medium and that balance of, um, you know, what works. And I think, you know, they're they're trying to iron out the kinks um, with what what they've got going with the transfer portal and and, and NIL. But the, the kids having the ability to choose for themselves and have the power um, it's something that I'm always going to advocate for and respect. But yeah, I mean, I, I, um, it never crossed my mind to leave. You know, I, I made my decision. You know, I was, I was happy with where I was. Um, and I felt like, you know, we had our opportunities to, to, to bring a national championship back to Norman and we just, it, it didn't happen. It didn't really fall that way, but agreed. I kind of agree with you too. You know, there should, uh, should be some opportunities for players shouldn't be penalized. And so I think at some point we'll get back to the happy medium in terms of the transfer portal, but you did touch on NIL. You have such a big personality. People around you played with have such a big personality. I, I just feel that there could have been a lot of NIL opportunities on your guys' hands in Oklahoma if that was uh, the case back then. Do you think if social media was kind of bigger then, even bigger, then do you think you would have had a little bit more fame, uh, a little bit uh, – a little bit more opportunities in that facet or money in my pocket for sure. <laughs> yeah. I would have more money in my pocket, man. I we were broke broke as can be in college, man. Like my my mom, you know, wasn't able to to give me money. And I, when I left the house, I wasn't gonna ask for anything. So we got our Pell Grant, you know, our stuff from the government, and then we had our scholarship check. 
and and that was it so it would have been nice to have extra money in my pocket but man the hunger that i had because i didn't have anything in my pocket also contributed to the way that i worked and my style of play and my mindset and so i think it's tough to say man like yes i would have loved to have been able to capitalize um on my name image and likeness and i definitely think that uh we would have racked up just with our personalities and the way that you know we understood marketing like i i had a crazy hairdo i was fully sleeved when that stuff wasn't happening like my hair had a twitter page like all these things were happening <laughs> naturally like I, you know i wasn't it, we were marketing before we understood what marketing was and so um you know the cali trio like all those things we, we could have benefited from but uh yeah i mean it's tough to say like i said i was so hungry because i didn't have shit and so um you know i i, I feel for these kids nowadays because it you know it's you got money in your pocket you know it's tough to to really stay motivated and focus on the game at some point when you know you're making a couple m's you know at 17 18 19 years old yeah a lot of kids don't i mean they they know what to do with that money or they can spend it is what they know how to do with it but you don't necessarily know always what the right decisions are and it can definitely i feel like change you and like you said like that toughness that you had and that work ethic you know that you know just hunger to sum it all up um speaking on toughness we were just I was going to ask you like if you had a favorite I mean a favorite game or a favorite moment but I was thinking the Damian that block for Damian Williams when you lit up Quandre Diggs <laughs> that, that, was, that spoke to some toughness but you got any favorite uh, moments or games that that come to mind man that that block means so much to me because of how much coach Jay Norvell preached um blocking you know mm -hmm. for us and in that game, we knew we weren't going to be throwing the ball much. So he was telling us, find another way to get involved. Find another way for for this crowd to to recognize and remember who you are. And so I'm flying around, um, you know, in, in that game, just trying to find an opportunity. And bam, there it was. And so that is a great memory of mine. But if my I think my greatest memory is when we played West Virginia in that shootout because I, for the first time in my career, felt like for some reason, I could put the team on my back. So I went over to the defensive side of the ball and was like, look, if we have the ball last, I promise you we'll win. Like these dudes cannot stop me. Like, I promise you. And like, I never, I wasn't like that. Like I was leading by example and I was, you know, I was a rah, rah guy, but I told them straight up, looked them in the eyes, like, look, if y'all give me the ball, like we'll win this game. And we did. And uh, it like brought tears to my eyes. I was emotional after the game, going to the locker room and Tony was looking at me like, why are you crying? <laughs> and I just like felt like, damn, like I did what I said what I was going to do. And, um, you know, it was just a big, it was a huge team win for us. Yeah, just felt that. We're actually running the highlight right now to see <laughs> yeah. that was a hell of a moment, the slant on the fourth down to catch it to win the game. Yeah, and, and Landry, Landry uh, actually audible for like the first time. Like he was very much so, do what the coach said, um, you know, play it by the book. And he looked at me and gave me the slant signal, and there it was. I said, all right, let's go. <laughs> I got it. That game actually gets brought up a lot, too, because the Tavon Austin highlights, one of the most popular highlight tape of all time. Yeah. What do you kind of remember just the way that game flowed about the defense trying to stop Tavon Austin and then just kind of after the game, like we won the game, but it was kind of like, Haven Austin kind of had a legendary night. So just remember what – talk about what you remembered about that and just kind of witnessing that. And then you had your moment yourself. You said, all right. You got the last laugh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, first, I want to say this. A lot of people do not know this, but I was tipped off the night before the game that Tavon was going to be put at running back for the first time. And I tried to tell Mike at the time <laughs> that this was going to happen. And he kind of looked at me and blew me off. I was like, oh, yeah, we got a plan for it, whatever. Somebody had wrote me on Twitter, like in a direct message or in a, or in a, um, and I mentioned was like, yo, I seen it. It's going to happen. Like, you guys need to be prepared for it. So whatever. It happens. The kid's going crazy out there. And I mean, it wasn't there wasn't really much that we could do or say like the kid, like you can't you can't deny his ability and you know our game plan wasn't wasn't very good i think we were trying to go man across the board with tony like spying on him or something which is which is tough tony's not the fastest guy he's a great tackler in open field but i mean trying to tackle table and also one-on-one open field is 
good luck. And so um, I focused less on what was happening and more on what I could do, what I can control, what I could handle. And so we were happy to get out of there with a W. But, yeah, it's you never want to be in those types of shootout games. We, we work way too hard for that. We're, where our players are, you know, the caliber of our players is, is way too high to be in a, in a game like that. And so uh, it's embarrassing. But like I said, you come out with a win. And, I mean, that, that game hurt hurt Tony's draft stock and – Obviously made the sickest highlight tape ever for for Tavon, but um, we got the W, so I guess that's all that matters. Yeah, you, you guys had. I mean, that's. I just saw in that clip of you, you. I don't know if you could see it. Elaine Johnson's walking by. You guys fist bump as you're walking off the field. I mean, just you guys were loaded. You know, with at every position, yes. that was one of the better teams that we've had around here. Um, so I guess transitioning into the NFL, you know, you had you had a great career, nine years. Um, you know, a couple different squads, just kind of, you know, talk about that. What was that transition like into the NFL? You know, cause you did, you left here as a junior and, you know, you went out there, bet on yourself and, and obviously, you know, it ended up, you know, ended up paying off. Yeah, man. So I, I left um, early because I felt like I needed to be challenged um, at the next level. You know, I left early because, you know, I wanted to take care of my family um, and I left early because we we didn't really know what our quarterback situation was going to be going into that next year. And so Pops, Bob was not very happy <laughs> with that decision. I remember. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I know myself well. And I, I know that if I'm not going to be challenged, that I just become a, a, a nuisance and a menace. And I didn't want to be that there in Oklahoma and on that team. And so... Yeah, I, I bet on myself. I was ready. I told, like I told you guys before, three and out was my plan. So there I was, and I fell in the draft, and it ended up becoming a blessing because I fell in the lap of the New Orleans Saints, and I'm drafted to play with the Hall of Fame quarterback and Drew Brees, and you know maybe a, a future Hall of Fame coach and Sean Payton, and so ended up being a blessing in disguise. It can it, it motivated me even more to prove uh, my worth. I think I was like the 16th or 17th receiver in that draft class. And maybe four or five of those dudes, I would say, um, you know, were as good or better than I was. So, um, yeah, I really just put a chip on my shoulder. And But, you know, all things considered, it was a huge blessing, you know, playing behind Lance Moore and Marcus Colston and playing with Jimmy Graham and Darren Sproles and Pierre Thomas. Like, these dudes were, are, are legends in their own right and had come off, you know, winning a Super Bowl. So... I just fell in line and followed what they did. Anything those veteran players were doing, uh, I just tried to, to to copy and replicate. And I got really lucky, like I was saying before with Ryan, and the fact that Lance Moore um, helped usher me in, really, with, with no jealousy, um, with no ego, was just a great teammate and saw the writing on the wall, the fact that, you know, he was a veteran that was making, you know, a good amount of money and I was a rookie that, you know, they were going to be able to replace him with. And so he he showed me the ropes. Uh, you know, he helped me with all my routes and reading coverages and uh, getting on the same page with Drew. And so the, the transition was fairly easy, man. The guys had gotten hurt and that were in front of me during training camp. And so I started uh, preseason week one with the ones and I knew my my plays and I caught the ball and had a good relationship on the field with Drew. And so I, have you know, started that first preseason game and then I never looked back, man. And so everything happens for a reason, you know, and, I, and I, I've had the best time um, throughout my career. And, you know, I stirred some shit up, you know, standing up for social justice. And uh, but I mean, I, bro, I'm healthy. You know, I had no major injuries in my career and no surgeries. Um, and I had opportunities to play with great guys all throughout the league. And, you know, it just happens to be that, you know, I got nine years out of it and was hoping to get, you know, a couple more and, you know, it is what it is, but yeah, I, I enjoyed my time and it was a huge blessing for me. That's a big blessing to walk away with, uh, mm -hmm. a healthy body, healthy mind, easier said than done, you know, walking away with a nine year yeah. career and going to that. You talked a little bit about that building that base in New Orleans, you know, from those guys, from the leadership. What is there anything else other than your hunger that contributed to that nine year career? Because nine years is a long time for a receiver, you know, or for any player in the NFL. But nine years is a long time uh, to last and perform at the level that you did. So what are kind of is there anything else that you kind of attribute um, that 
contributed to the longevity of your career? Yeah, man. So my dad played seven years in the league. I always, you know, you, you're in competition with your pops, you know, in, in your own mind, or I was at least. And so to be able to get past him um, was something that was big for me. But, man, I just, you know, getting to a second contract is huge. Um, and being consistent, you know, and, and doing things at the highest level all the time, looking in the mirror and reflecting on, you know, who I am as a player and finding my weak spots and trying to uh, – work on those and get better at them. I mean, my, my motivation really was to take care of my family. Um, so, you know, when my, when I got drafted, I retired my mother and, you know, was able to really take care of her and treat her like the queen that she is. And, um, and as, as my career, you know, went on, I found new ways to motivate myself and, uh, really just being the best version of the best player that I could be. You know, I know I'm not, um, you know, Calvin Johnson, I know I'm not Randy Moss. I know I'm, you know, I'm Kenny Stills. I'm like, how, who, and how can I be the best version of that player? And what does that player look like? And so that was my motivation. Um, and, and then obviously I, I was, uh, <laughs> really big on self-preservation, you know? So, uh, there wasn't many, very times that, that I was hit hard. You know, you had to really catch me off guard to to get me. You know, I was catching the ball and, and making moves and getting down or catching the ball and getting out of bounds, or I was behind you, you know, going going deep for a ball. So, uh, you know, a lot of self-preservation and, and luck, you know, because uh, you can't make it nine years. I mean, really, I played 25 years of football since I was six years old. I played and I only missed one season of ball with a broken ankle. So um, that's that's pretty fucking incredible. Yeah, you talk about that consistency, and it's like you have that end goal and you have that in mind. Like you said, competing with your pops, he played seven, you want to make it more. But really, I feel like it's just, you know, being consistent, and it's like really one foot in front of the other, day by day, stacking days, and then eventually you look up and you're there, you know, and it just, you know, it kind of just hits you in the face. That's got to be awesome. I guess um, that kind of transitions into talking about, like, where, where you are now, you know? I mean, you've, you, you know, you've had that awesome career, and then, you know, now uh, what's life after football? How's it treating you? Yeah, man. So I'm pretty lucky to um, have had a fairly smooth transition. And during COVID, I I got invited to go to the mountains and I learned how to snowboard. And so when I was, you know, towards the end of my career, I'm like, okay, when when I'm done playing, I'm going to move to the mountains and I'm going to start snowboarding. Um, And so that's what I did Uh, a couple of years ago. I went and worked out for Cleveland and they told me you know they were gonna stay with the younger guys or whatever and I was like you know what tired of kind of uh twiddling my thumbs and waiting for an opportunity let me just move to the mountains and so I did that so I've been in Aspen Colorado for the past three years uh in the winter time uh snowboarding backcountry uh helicopter skiing like just trying it all really just having the opportunity to to learn um something again like I wasn't I didn't grow up skiing and snowboarding all the time. So building resilience um, as an adult was huge for me, love humbling myself and sucking at something and having to learn. And so I think that was huge for me in my transition process because it taught me that that's what, what everything was going to be like everywhere that I went from now on. I just came from the top. I was mastering something top, you know, whatever percentage of, of players, you know, and, and football. And now anywhere that I go, whether it's business or other hobbies, like I was going to have to humble myself and uh, be able to learn and, 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 and start at square one again. And so I've been doing that. I've been traveling a ton um, anywhere and everywhere that you can think. I just got my scuba certification. So uh, I've been learning to snowboard and surf, you know, got scuba certified. I'm writing a book about, um, you know, my more about the activism portion of my career and just using that uh, to try and inspire people to to use our superpower you know i think my superpower was always you know my problem with authority and my my rebel attitude and really just always like choosing to be myself wherever i was and I, that ended up showing up in my my social justice work, being able to stand 10 toes down, regardless of what other people thought, knowing in my gut, in my gut, in my heart of hearts that uh, what I was doing was right. And uh, so, yeah, man, I'm I'm keeping myself busy and uh, just trying to be of service. I take a job with the league, uh, working with the legends, which is our retired guys. So I do outreach 
um, and just reach out to our guys and make sure that they're good, make sure that they know that they have direct contact to the league, whatever they need, however they want to use um, the league's resources. And so I'm in a good place, man. And so I think it's our responsibility when we're in a good place to be able to uh, give back and serve others. And so that's really what I'm on, man. I just do my best to uh, to be of service and to be a good human and, uh, you know, uplift all the vibrations of the places that I show up in. I think a lot of people can take away yeah, a lot of things that you just said right there. I know I can personally. I wanted to ask uh, real fast. You talked about harnessing your superpower uh, and you said that the rebel mindset, you know, and harnessing that and using it for good. At what point did you figure out that was your superpower? And then what, at what point after that were you able to say, OK, I can use this for good or I can channel this into a manner that is positive? Yeah, more more that I've realized it in the past couple of years as I've reflected um, about how I got to where I was. And I'll say that I was never um, like a political person. I was never really, I had never paid attention to politics. My parents didn't talk to me much about it. Didn't talk about social issues. Like, you know, we were a football family, a sports family. So we were, we were busy with sports all the time. And so when I was called upon in my own heart, um, you know, to get involved in the player protests and to start work, you know, doing work in social justice space, I was confused because I didn't know what, where that was coming from, but I felt it in my heart. And so I had to make this decision to get involved. And so we start getting involved and in taking this action. And I was just following, following my heart. You know, I'm praying for guidance all the time. And this is what I'm, you know, being told what to do. And so when I reflect on it now, it's like, I think about all the times that I was choosing to to go, you know, down my own path, like like in college, for example, you know, we had mandatory study hall, but I didn't need study hall. We needed 10 hours a week that we had to be there. Mm -hmm. I didn't need those 10 hours. I was passing my classes. But, you know, Bob would get on me like, you need to go to study hall like everybody else. It's a team thing, all this stuff. And I just like I didn't think that that applied to me, like the cookie cutter system does not apply to everyone. And so I, I just didn't go. And so we always had issues <laughs> with the <laughs> fact that I didn't do stuff like that. But it's just like I, I was taking care of my schoolwork. I was balling on the field like I don't understand. I didn't understand. And so um, just thinking about that when I reflect, it was like, yeah, that might, might, might not have been the best decision. But I was always choosing myself first and just figuring out now, OK, how do I take that thing that can be a problem and, and use it for good? And that's what ended up happening with me getting involved in in the social justice space and now being able to stand up and speak for people um, that don't necessarily have the platform or a voice to do it. Yeah, well, we really respect what you're doing and we appreciate, you know, you coming on today. We won't hold you up any longer. I hope I hope your trip goes well. Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate it, bro. I'm, I'm happy to be on. I'll always come rap with you guys whenever and I wish you the best. Now, it'd be really cool if we got you, Brennan and Tony, for a uh, little <laughs> for a joint episode i'm sure we can turn up a little bit yeah, of stories. maybe hilarious. some schmitty stories yeah. <laughs> stair master stories we'll start the chronicles oh, going my, my goodness i think tony's going to be there this weekend uh for the spring game it's my birthday weekend so i i'm it's always a decision for me to make if i'm going to be there or not but uh i'll be looking forward to hearing about it happy early birthday yeah uh, from all of us at Sooner School. I'll, tell, I'll tell tony what's up we'll see we'll see yeah, if, we'll see we'll see if we can get him on yeah the weather's not going to be great, so uh, <laughs> it's going to be rainy and a little bit cold. But, you know, we push through. We move through. So, Kenny, thanks for coming on today. Uh, everybody, thank you for joining another edition of The Family Business. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. It all helps. We appreciate you, and remember to keep it in the family.